May God's grace and peace be with you through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I never had the opportunity to go through wood shop or to, uh, in high school or in grade school or really to have formal training in working with wood. But one of the things that, if you've ever worked with wood, that you discover is how important it is to sand a board properly. Now, a lot of people will just randomly take a piece of sandpaper and they'll go to that board and they'll willy-nilly sand it around. And usually you end up making it rougher. You end up putting scratches and maybe even gouges in it. But if you really want to properly sand a piece of wood, and any of the carpenters in here can correct me if I'm wrong, you look at it. And you look at the grain, and then you even can feel the grain. And you can touch the grain and feel the veins of the wood, and you can feel that there's a specific pattern in the wood. That God in his creation, even though each board is unique, that there's a specific pattern. And if you want to properly sand, if you want to go smoothly, you go with the grain. You sand it and it comes out more smooth. Now this may take more time, but it comes out smoothly. When you go willy-nilly, when you go randomly, a lot of times the board, it ends up getting rougher. Sometimes people want to say, oh, that's the roughest spot, and they'll really focus on it. But that ends up with a rougher spot. Sometimes you even tear your sandpaper doing that. So if you want things to go smoothly, it's best to go with the grain consistently. Amaziah, although not a carpenter, he seemed to have this down pat. In fact, Amaziah, he knew exactly what it meant to, to go with the grain. See, he was hired by King Jeroboam to be a priest, to, to be a priest in the temple of Bethel. And if you don't know your Old Testament history, Bethel was not actually the worship site. The worship site was in Jerusalem. But he was paid by King Jeroboam to preach, to offer sacrifices in Bethel, which was a false worship site. And he knew where his bread was buttered. He knew how important it was for him to go with the grain. He knew that when Amos told the king that what he was doing was wrong, that he couldn't follow suit. Instead, he said, oh no, king, you are a great king. You won't die by the sword. Or the people of Israel, oh no, people of Israel, you're fine. Keep doing what you're doing. Because Amos, in fact, was actually a nobody from nowhere. He was from Judah, and he wasn't even from Israel. He had come up there to preach to these people and correct these people, and they didn't want to hear it. They wanted to hear the good message. They wanted to hear that what they were doing was right. And so Amos was given a veiled threat by Amaziah. If you look at our text, you see this threat that basically if you come back here, you won't live to go, to go anywhere again. So Amos had a particularly difficult job. He had to go against the grain. He had to challenge the status quo. Here you had Amaziah, who was supposed to be a religious leader for the people, who, well, he was saying one thing. And here you have Amos going against the grain, roughing things up, if you will, creating a few gouges. Not necessarily something that we all enjoy doing. In fact, as we look through Scripture, we see that it's not always a pleasant job to be a prophet of God. Amaziah was a politician. Amos was God's prophet. Look at what happened to John the Baptist in our New Testament lesson for today from our gospel. He was beheaded for correcting the, the sinful behavior, the adulterous behavior of Herod and Herodias. Look at what happened to the greatest prophet. When he went against the grain, when Jesus challenged the, the priests, the teachers of the law, the scribes and the Pharisees, he also was put to death. It's not easy to go against the grain, is it? In fact, when we go against the grain, oftentimes it roughs things up in our lives and makes things more difficult in our lives. When we challenge the status quo, when we go against what everyone else is saying, life gets harder. It's easier just to go with the grain, isn't it? It's much more smooth to just follow with the grain. Isn't that what most Christians do? Isn't that what we do? We just go with the grain. We go with the flow. Instead of challenging that which is different than God's word, it's easier to just coast along, to sail along, to follow in the grain of the world. Because when you challenge the world, when you stand out in the world, things get rougher for you. If a church stands out and says that a sin is a sin and challenges people on it, they're called the church that is evil, that they're the wicked ones. Things get rougher for them in their community. Think about your personal relationships. Think about your own lives. When you call someone out on their sin, how do they respond? 
Sometimes they do respond, thankfully, but more often than not, they don't want to hear it. More often than not, they don't want you to challenge them where they're at in their lives. They don't want to hear you say that what they're doing is wrong. Many of you have children and grandchildren. You know that the relationships that your children and grandchildren engage in are extramarital. But it's easier than to challenge them on that because you don't want to get into a fight. Many of you have brothers and sisters. You have cousins. You have friends. You have relatives who you know are not in church this morning, who won't be in church this weekend, who haven't been in church in several weeks. But instead of challenging them on that, instead of telling them that this is hurting their relationship with God, it's easier to just go with the groove. Many of you know people who struggle with addiction. Struggle with addiction from alcohol, drugs, pornography. Even addiction to work. But it's easier to not challenge them. To stand back. To, to pray for them. Than to call them out. And tell them what they're doing is wrong. It's easier for a church to stand back. Even when its community makes difficult decisions than to get into the fray of things. And we've been put into this place. We've learned what it means to be politicians, what it means to be comfortable. We've learned what it means to go with the grain instead of going against the grain. Amos, John the Baptist, Christ himself, even go through all of the prophets. They did not fall, bend underneath what the world said. Because it's easier, but it's not what God said. Here we had the prophet Amos, who he was not special in any way. He was a sheep herder, or maybe even just a shepherd. But God chose him. God chose him to challenge the sin of the world, to challenge the sin of the people around him. And there was a reason for that. God did not want to destroy his people. The people of Israel were his chosen people. But because of their sinfulness, he saw no other option. Because of their wickedness, they had their, a price must be paid. He sent Amos to correct them that they might return to him. Because they'd been hearing the wrong message. They'd been hearing this message from Amaziah that everything they were doing was okay. And isn't that how it goes in our world today? When people just hear the message of the world. When our children and our grandchildren, when our communities around us hear the message of the world. They're told what's right and what's wrong. What about your children? What about your grandchildren? What about the people in your, that are your neighbors in your community? Who tells them what's right or wrong? Judge Judy, Judge Joe Brown, Dr. Phil, Oprah? Professors at a school who tell them that tolerance is the way to go, regardless of what Scripture says. Teachers who tell them there's a law of love. That true love is going to ignore those things which God calls sin. Who is educating your children and grandchildren? Who is educating your family and friends, your community? So often it's easier to just go with what the world says. So often it is easier to fall into that groove and fall into line. Because when we go against it, when we challenge the status quo, People are not happy with us. People will get upset. When we t challenge our children and our grandchildren, we gra challenge the people in our lives, that hurts. When we rough them up and tell them a sin is a sin, they don't want to hear it. Sometimes they respond and they say, who are you? Who are you to judge me? Well, who are we? The answer is easy. We're sinners. We're sinful people who have broken God's law. We're people who have failed to keep God's command. We're people who are not just sinners, but we are full of sin. There's not, just one, there's not a day of our life that goes by that we are not sinful human beings. So who are we then? Do we have any right to rough things up? To go against the grain? Do we have any right to go against what the world says. Absolutely. Because our God has called us. He has challenged us. 
He has called us to go against the grain of this world and to go against what, what, what people say that even, and that when it opposes Scripture, that we might challenge it. He has called us to be those who, cha- who raise up our children, who discipline our children. He has called us to face our neighbors and even when they are living in sinful relationships, to tell them that it is against God's Word. It is not as though we stand there in the seat of judgment, though. We are not the ones who are judging, but it is God Himself. And it is God's Word. See, too often the argument gets skewed because people do call us. And they say, you are a hypocrite. But the truth is, we're not being hypocrites when we are speaking God's Word. When we are speaking God's truth. And this is hard for us, though, because we are people. We are people who have sinned and we have failed to keep God's law. We are people who have gone with the grain for far too long. We don't want to create scars or gouges. We don't want to create scratches. And that's what people need. Because that's what we needed. We needed to see that we were sinners. We needed to see that we were poor, miserable sinners and that we had no hope of salvation. We needed to see that we had broken God's law and that there was nothing we could do to fix it. But we needed to see that our God loved us enough to send us a Savior. That our God loved us enough to bring salvation into this world. That we might say along with Paul, and you also were included in Christ, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having believed you were marked in Him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession, to the praise of His glory. Now that's a really long way of Paul to say that we are the people of God who have been marked by Him, who have been redeemed by Him. We are the people of God who He called out of the darkness of our sinfulness. See, Jesus, He did not go with the grain. He did not go, go with, make things smooth. He challenged it. He challenged the teachers of the law and the scribes and the Pharisees because He knew the message they preached was hopelessness. The message that they proclaimed ended in nothingness and emptiness. The message He proclaimed had a message of hope. And so he went against the grain. He challenged the status quo. He challenged it for us. And God, our Father, he went against the grain too. He went against the grain and he looked at us and instead of seeing us as junky old boards, worn out and broken, he saw us as those who he could finish. Those that we could be. He looked at you and he said, I know you're dried up and that you're broken that you're cracking and rotting. But I will breathe new life into you. You have gnarls. You have scars. You've been torn up. You've been left out in the sun. But I will raise you up and I will make you whole again. He looked at us. And he saw us not as what we were. Poor, miserable sinners. But as people. His own people. His own people who He elected before the foundations of the earth to rescue and to save. He saw us as His own people who, he did, who, he, who were not perfect, but were made perfect by Him. We were in the scrap pile. We were in the junk heap getting ready to be burned and He picked through. He pulled each of us, each of us out and He rescued us because of what Christ did on the cross. Because Christ did die on that gnarled cross. Because Christ did experience the scars and the gouges of pain. Because Christ did experience the rejection. He chose us. And not only us, but He chose all people. He chose all people in this world. He did not see any of us as scrap lumber, as those who should just be tossed to the side. But He saw each one of us to be His own children. And who are we? Who are we to look at someone's scars and forget our own? Who are we to look at someone's gouges and forget our own? Who are we to look at someone's scratches and forget our own? Those gouges and scars and scratches, those are their character. Those are their need. Those are the same needs that we had. If the master builder did not reject them, how can we reject them? Because when we don't go against the grain, when we just accept what the world has to say, that's in essence what we're doing. We're rejecting them and saying, oh well, it's too late for them after all. But there's no one that it's too late for. 
There's no one that there's too late for because we have the message of hope, the message of salvation that brings life to the dead. We have the message of hope and salvation which was proclaimed and that, and that gave us new life. We have the message of salvation that changes hearts and changes lives. And it may seem easier at the time to be a politician, to go into the world and to just be like the world. But God has called us not to be politicians but prophets. He's called us to go against the world, to be different, to be people in this world who raise our children, to be God-fearing, God-loving children, who have called us to be people in this world who defend the rights of those who cannot defend their own life. There are many people who are dying, elderly people who are not receiving the care that they need. God has called us to stand up for those people, those who do not have voice, not because of we know them even, not because they're good friends of ours or because we love them, but because He has loved them. And just think about it. Think about all the things that are going on in our world today. All the people who are, being, who are missing out on that good news message. In just two weeks, we're going to invite some children to worship with us, to sing with us, to praise with us. Some of these children at their young age already have experienced gouges, scratches, scars. Some of those scars and gouges, they're deep. And it's almost impossible to smooth out. But those children need to hear the gospel message. Those children need to hear the love. And there are many places that God has placed us in the world to do that. In two weeks when we do that, that is just one opportunity we have to share God's love. But just think about the other places God puts you in this world. Think about the places that you go every single day the people that you interact with, the people that you talk to, the people that you see. Because those are the people who need to hear the message of salvation. Those are the people who need to stop hearing that empty promise of the world and hear the life-giving promise of hope, the life-giving promise that we have of salvation, the life-giving promise that brought us from death to life, the life-giving promise that will one day will bring us from this world to the next. That is the message that we have. And so may God shape and form us to be his people, to be his prophet, to go out and to proclaim his word. Amen. Please pray with me. Dear Lord Jesus, we know that we are broken and that we are dried up, that we are gnarled and scarred, that we have many knots and we have many many pains in this life. We pray, Lord, that we would not let those, though, interfere with the message of salvation which you have planted in our hearts. We pray, Lord, that you would work in each, and one, each one of our lives to smooth out those pains and that suffering, to smooth out those gnarls and those scars with the hope and promise of salvation. We pray, Lord, that even as we are smoothed out in your word, even as we enter into the groove of your word, that we would go against the world. That we would challenge the injustice. That we would challenge the message of tolerance with your message in Scripture. That we would seek to raise our children and our grandchildren. That we would seek to, to be advocates in our community for you. That all that we know, that all that we interact with, that they may know the promise of salvation. Lord, this is not an easy request or an easy task. You have not told us that it would be easy. And we know that it was not easy for your prophets, that it was not easy for you. But like all things in life, those things which come easy are usually worthless. This, your gospel message, is worth it. For it is the gospel message that has brought us salvation. And may it be the gospel message which leads us forth. This we pray in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen.